Oh, hey. I just played all the Mega Man Zero games, so, uh, how you reckon that went? Oh, oh my god! I know. K-Bash, you're gonna tank your credibility! DON'T DO IT! I think I got that covered, thanks. Running through these games back to back sparked a lot of thoughts, brought a lot of frustration with my own method bubbling to the surface. A figurative wander through the desert to be as miserable and pretentious as possible. Not that I didn't have fun. I had lots of fun. All kinds of fun. I'm serious! But I was hopeful at the outset. I grew up with Zero Four, still love that game, and I knew that the rest of the series would feature Zero, but different, Mega Man gameplay, but different, dramatic storytelling, intentional difficulty, unbelievable animal robot designs. No clue why there's no fighter spin-off. Come on, guys. The Turtle Shore Yukins. This is so easy. I thought I'd get a little experimental this time, do my shtick, but have one half a quarter think while I'm at it. So here it is. The Mega Man Zero Disaster Review. Mega Man Zero, console of origin, Game Boy Advance. First released in 2002, pubbed by Capcom and devved by Inti Creates, a Capcom fail son known for a speed power gun bike and love and destroy. But the shot at a series spin-off, Mega Man Zero, and its eventual success pulled them up a couple tiers, enough to greenlight a whole series of Zero games. Zero One's tough and rough, equally. Tough because it'll stomp whatever hurts most on your body and laugh. Rough because it's got all kinds of design flaws, some obvious and others tech-related. If it's someone's favorite game in the series, they're a speedrunner, and it's a coin flip if you'll get a good faith discussion about the game. Hence. That means levels riddled with instant death traps, segments that require precise inputs, often in rapid succession to survive, enemies set to appear and strike the player from off screen with somewhere between 20 frames or less of reactability, and more! But it's not some developer oversight, okay? It's first degree murder, not second degree, not manslaughter. Mega Man Zero is designed with intention, the cruelty is the point. Granted, this is second hand from the producer of the Zero Collection and the ZX subseries, who said that the aim of the Zero series was to make it the most challenging out of all the Mega Man series of games. Taken as true, it's easy to see why a new player's first foray into Mega Man Zero, having picked up the Nintendo Switch collection, might be a little rocky. Just a little. More than challenged, the devs wanted a darker story, highlighting the tension between pre-existing factions, the resistance force that Zero joins, made up predominantly of reploids labeled terrorists, and Neo Arcadia, the domineering metropolis that squashes attempts at reploid liberation. It's a smart setup, makes the player question if the dour protagonist and his violent, yikers takedowns of enemy reploids are truly righteous. It's especially intelligent for establishing your greatest opposition, the Four Guardians, as self-styled protectors of humanity, the bulk of which reside in Neo Arcadia. The design of the major players is meant to visually bridge the more human Mega Man Legends and the more robotic Mega Man X, a respectable direction for a fairly politicized conflict about the liberation of an oppressed robotic group. Q Mega Man was never political in the comments. Let's light this most garbage fire up! That's the game. How's the play? So true. So true. This is the gameplay. What? Oh, fuck. Yes, I would like to do this for five hours. I'm being uncharitable. Zero One is comprised of a series of stages accessible from the main resistance base. A cool concept for a series coming off the old stage select. You can chat up all the weird and wacky reploids, hit a fat boof, and get chopping. The levels are sharp with enemies placed to stop your progress every 10 feet or so. The game expects you to know the layouts, expects you to anticipate nearly everything in the stage and with the grading system calling you stupid level over level, oh, slowpoke, you shut your goddamn mouth! It's fishing for repeat players, and I'm sure it accomplished that on release, but nowadays it's a hard sell. The Switch version has toggleable checkpoints, which make the game at least somewhat accessible to a wider audience, myself included. Back on the old GBA, though, death meant replaying a stage from the start. If you lived through that era, uh, hey, How's therapy going? Maybe fishing for repeat players is inaccurate. The base game demanded your time and attention, or kicked you out. 
The Switch version's asking nicely. Passive-aggressively, anyway. At least MMZ weaves its story and gameplay together nicely. You'll do a few stages, get interrupted by some impending doom, and get it dealt with. You get the sense that though Zero is powerful, even legendary, his vulnerability is the people he's sworn to protect. I won't fault that setup. It's good drama, and it's reinforced by certain missions that ask you to engage with and rescue various members of your resistance. It's stuff I didn't care about during the play, but writing now about the bigger picture, it's worthwhile story telling. A lot of the levels are personally offensive to me and my religion, tiny baby games, but a good chunk of my suffering would have been cured by simply looking up the sub-tank locations, extra health packs for people who've never played Mega Man. Is that a person? So it's hard to complain about difficulty in good faith between the internet age, checkpoints, even cyber elves, a whole system of temporary gameplay enhancers, some of which can heal, and unlike some other entries, the elves die here, meaning you have access to some health on the fly, some. In short, there's a few powerful ways to make the game easier, even better if you got a bad score in the level. The bosses won't even have access to their signature move, which is kind of amazing, like RE4's adaptive difficulty, only it doesn't solve the fundamental frustration of boss fights in general. I think the only reason the game still gets complained about is that it's discouraging by design. You're constantly getting hit by things you haven't adapted to yet. You're having to explore these openly lethal levels for cyber elves and sub tanks to make the experience easier. You have to go all the way back to the level you just did for objective number two, have fun! You're not given immediate access to all your weapon attacks, including the charge attack, because you gotta level it up first, I guess. The devs slap Aztec Falcon in your face first! My channel description used to say, we have fun here, and it doesn't anymore. Boss battles are frustrating. They bring the challenge, no doubt. They've got impeccable designs. They've got devastating attacks. They're varied, and I'm not sure why they weren't sold as action figures, but what they come down to in every Zero game is memorization. You're going to get hit. You're going to die in four to six impacts with a projectile with a stray hitbox by not dashing in time, by positioning yourself a pixel too close. A fuck! And you'll die ad nauseum until you know every attack and dodge it. I swear it felt like I was getting 50-50 by some of these, okay? Like it's a fighting game. You know, Elephant Man might swing twice or he might swing three times. Hope you've got fast hands. I could easily slice the footage to show only my good runs, but the reality is this. Game puts the brakes on progress harder than Ninja Gaiden. Yeah, gonna throw that out there real quick. Not because it's bad inherently, but because it's time, and you're not being rewarded with trophies and new costumes or weapons or anything. You've got a steep cliff face climb and the bare minimum in gear. Maybe an apple to keep your blood sugar up. Have fun, hombre. Hey, I'm allowed to nitpick, right? We do that here, huh? How come when I walk into the final boss room for the 30th time, I still gotta smash A through the same cutscene dialogue I read 30 minutes ago, just so I can run it back two minutes later? My thumb hurts. Also, insert complaints about being able to combo bosses with a single saber slash so you don't incur end lag on a second or third combo slash. So Zero trashes Copy X, the villain and leader of Neo Arcadia. According to the devs, it was gonna be the original X, but they didn't want to send a bad message. Fair enough. It's pretty funny to watch already. Like, yeah, basically Zero and the Inti Create spinoff in particular is spiritually so much cooler than X, guys. Look at them all ruined. He's a pile of garbage, a high-tech filth puddle. Lol. Lamau. I suck farts, you blue bastard. <laughs> Some of you less invested people might be groaning right now. Is he seriously gonna go through each game? Who cares? Like most of what I cover, there's stories in transitions, additions, considerations, change. Zero Two looks nearly identical, but introduced many things. It treads old ground, and sometimes worse, highlights whole series hangups. It's probably someone's favorite, but I don't know who that is. And don't worry, game's still packed with fun. It starts with Zero having uh, hung around in the desert for a while after the events of the last game, nearly dying and eventually rejoining the Resistance. Zero, what were you doing in the desert all this time? Things. The central tension involves newcomer Alpizo. He's evil. No f <gasps> way. He's not evil. Alpizo's a power-hungry leader type who came to lead the resistance during Zero's absence. You can tell he's evil because he's a man in a position of power coded feminine. 
Love it. He pushes for aggression against Neo Arcadia, even leading his troops into battle himself, while Ciel from the first game tries to resolve the conflict between Reploids and humans by inventing a new source of energy. That, she assures us, is a historically proven way to end conflict. I think she missed the history lesson where, uh, if any nation isn't at war, historically, somebody's busting their ass to keep it that way, but yeah. Go idealism, bro. Also, the conflict here is about humans oppressing reploids. Like, what ideological lines is your energy solution tying up exactly? The major additions are new weapons, the form change system, unlockable EX skills, and elf system changes. Wow, that just sounds... So interesting, doesn't it? I didn't mention weapons in the first because there's four, but if you're uncomfortable with learning about the combo system or experimenting much, there's two. The games always feature a saber and blaster, and they followed that up with a shield boomerang, sometimes useful, sometimes useful, and a pokey thing of some kind. In the first, it's the rod, which is cool to implement if you're interested in learning a lot, but otherwise the saber will do you fine. In two, you get the chain rod. Looks sweet in the art, but mostly you're gonna be ripping off shields and platforming, so again, niche most of the time. What's really smart though, cause it was lacking in the first, is form changes and EX skills, basically unlockable color schemes with new abilities and special input moves to integrate into your offense. Unfortunately, you gotta pull an A rank stage over stage to get them all, so basically play the game over multiple times or stay poverty, dumbass. The forms are easier to unlock, you just need to complete certain objectives. I don't think the game tells you how to get them, but you'll get drip fed a few on a first playthrough and maybe feel good about yourself for two seconds, so that's nice. Left unchanged are the Cyber Elves, though they're largely unmissable now, because you can replay stages for them. You can collect a set number of Potion Elves, as it were, and get them back later with a little time and effort. Looking over the footage, I'm amazed by some of the stuff I got through. It's a tight set of games that never really changed, and with no immediate defensive option, just raw mobility, you're effectively forced to get good to survive. But it's not a good, like, I can handle this entire game. Rather, I'm familiar enough with the controls to occasionally look good, but like I said before, cutting footage together to look good is so easy. I don't think any YouTuber, unless they claim to be a master, should have their play examined with a microscope, even in a critique video or something, you know? Every perspective, every vector of conversation about a work of art is a single facet on the gem, never the totality. And I don't think anyone should strive to have the definitive take. It's dehumanizing. I say this all in reaction to games journalists taking flack for finding the game too hard, only the loudest voices can kind of damage the image of an IP, and even then, it's not usually enough to matter. I have no pretensions of being good at Mega Man Zero or having the definitive take. As a buyer and player, I had a real rough go, and it shows. And that's probably gonna be the average experience for others, right? I'm K-Bash. Mediocre gaming white guy, but sometimes the stuff I come up with is fairly inarguable. Despite the game pushing for an aggressive playstyle, that is, no real defensive options, your strongest weapon being melee range and minimal healing, it encourages passivity by design for anyone not familiar with the games. There's so much footage of me hanging back, being overly safe, it's boring footage, it's lame play. But what's the alternative? Rush through, trying to look cool, die suddenly to a miss input or a low reactability death trap, restarting is annoying. I don't get angry at games as much as I did in the past, but I do get angry when I waste time. And that's literally 50% or more of my footage. Low immediate competence represent! The bosses highlight a lot of what I've already brought up, and not in a good way. I remember getting brickwalled by the Phoenix boss. Not an impossible fight, just a lot of attacks that cycles through at random, and some tight action and punish windows. But I think I have over 30 minutes of death footage, so by the end, I just didn't take damage. Brute force learning, memorization, getting beat with a belt till you can recite the alphabet front to back perfectly. Nothing as fun as that. There's a polar bear early on, not a hard boss, but because of his enormous attacks, you're incentivized to just hang out on the wall and chip away with ranged options. Super interesting, really roping me into that aggressive playstyle. Get lamed out, fat ass. Panther Flaw Claws. Don't ask about the names, just don't. Literally requires that you slide between the trucks in his fight to stay safe. I mean, you don't have to, but then it's so you might as well play passive. I mean, if you want competent aggro players, design for it. How about this frog boss that does a lot of annoying stuff? Sure, but like the elephant from one, will literally hit you with a 50-50 when he drops out of the tree. During this specific attack, he'll either drop out of the tree on yours or the opposite side during the third drop. But with my tiny health pool, I refuse to admit that that's good design. It's obnoxious, unfairly punishing. Oh, you guessed wrong? Take the L, bro, and move on! Yeah.
Okay. Like, yes, acknowledged. Subtank locations are searchable online. Just explore more. Use Cyber Elves if you have to. I get it. 50-50s still suck. I mean, Jesus, so much stuff in this game is technically reactable on paper. Like, the attack only hits you after 20 frames, bro. Just jump. The human brain only needs, like, 10 frames. But it doesn't factor sensory overload, the general game speed, consistent rapid inputs numbing your brain. And having to, in this case, actually get off the wall. Dumb. Dumb. Anyway, El Pizzo basically goes insane. Oh, he's doing the anime eye! El Pizzo's pissed! And now the Dark Elf is resurrected. I mean, I can't with this. Fine, the elves aren't elves per se. They're sentient computer programs, and propping one up as a Dark Elf is really funny. But fine, it's a stylistic choice. It's good for objectifying the conflict, right? Couching CL's research for a new energy source in the Baby Elf. Understandable. Personifying the totality of the conflict, effectively a weapon of mass destruction, in the Dark Elf. Understandable. Zero Two has dramatic moments like the first. The series is great at taking time to pump up the tension, show how serious and impactful everything is. If I give the series credit for anything, it's that. I'm a bit disappointed it doesn't go into power politics or explore the narrative of liberation as strongly as I thought. Instead, it focuses on Dark Elf lore and Elpizo being driven mad with power. Copy X is supplanted by Elpizo in the finale, or uh, stabbed in a regenerative pod of some kind, but that's, that's semantics. Just semantics. I'm shocked. They thought that, yeah, the insane dip <laughs> with K-Bash bangs would make a good villain. The fight's pretty notorious for being easy, but at this point, two games, two sets of bosses, and in Mega Man X tradition, two boss rushes before the end, I'll take the breather. Drinking in a gaming video is usually a meme, or a relic from a time gone by. James Rolfe, for example. But this isn't for fun. This isn't because the game was so bad I had a drink to get through. I got through with pure black coffee. Hashtag Godot was right. I'm drinking because of what's coming. You know the story. The comment section. You got this or that factoid wrong. <laughs> Did you even bother researching the game? Twitter.com. I hate when YouTubers trademark are negative about a video game. If you don't like it, just don't play it. I'm tired. It seems like everyone's preoccupied with correcting other people or their behaviors. Well, why don't you go write the script then? Jeremy, why don't you make the video? Why don't you fall off? After the first level of Mega Man Zero Three, a much more forgiving stage with a story start, picking up with Dr. Vile and his diabolical plan to return from exile and rule Neo Arcadia, I thought, hey, maybe this is where it gets good. I was half right. I think the most common sentiment online about 3 is that it's the best one, and I'm not gonna argue that point, actually. It probably is, especially if you're invested. I was told by multiple people on multiple platforms to get into tech videos for Zero if I wanted to truly understand the game and have fun. And I think that's pretty telling. It means either that people know I love tech and react well to learning it, or that people are afraid I'll start bashing something I don't understand and look like a dumbass. Too late for that, bro. Or something in between. I choose to read it as altruism. So my PSA for these games is just that. If you want to get the most, go get the most. I usually don't because most people, normal mode experiencers, aren't enthusiasts, and because my show has limitations that really started to show through here. Because Zero Three is easier and kinder in several places, sometimes it feels deliberately designed for fun as opposed to challenge or misery. I actually found a sub-tank without looking it up, and other times it's putting the weirdest, most specifically difficult fight in front of you when its peers are all nothing by comparison. And at some point at 11 p.m. on a Wednesday night, you wonder if you're just burnt out, if your brain's overloaded, if you should tap out and do something else and just take the schedule hit. And even though I don't want to say it, the way I handle media is suboptimal, sometimes inherently. Look, I try to cover upwards of two full sets of games every month because I want to make substantial videos. I want to vary up the content on offer constantly. And because that's what's worked. You don't get those single game reviews very often because they almost always fail. If I dragged this series out the way I did Persona, I mean, numbers are right there. You tell me. You don't get other kinds of content because they're not guaranteed. That's the algorithm. That's giving back to the audience that bothered subscribing. And no, it's not a method that covers every subscriber, but on the whole, it's how I assure my future. And it's a ton of work. Most YouTubers can't be f to record more than two games a month, let alone what I pull. Not that it's an issue. It means they're healthier anyway. So yeah, burnout, all of that, I hear you. I hear the critics, and I agree. 
to a point. But I start and play every series genuinely excited. I always start hopeful, and if I didn't stick things out, never went outside my comfort zone, I'd never have found Darksiders 3 so fun. Never realized Bioshock 2 was amazing. Never experienced the first Final Fantasy tactics, or even glanced twice at Nier, Metal Gear, Persona. I've experienced so much good because I'm willing to try and try even when it gets a little rough. Like, games aren't so dramatic that they ruin my life for days on end. That's needlessly dramatic. Zero Three makes a few changes, and all of them kick ass. There's no weapon leveling, your weapons are instantly usable, so my dumb speedrunning that's not right. Haste running ass has access to moves I wouldn't have otherwise, unless I screwed around grinding or something. Cyber Elves were overhauled once again with the addition of satellite floater elves that don't die or decrease mission score, giving the player customizable passive benefits. You can enter cyberspace, like Battle Network, I guess, where every enemy drops health pickups and you'll be able to progress through stages using these safer alternate paths at the cost of score. Great accessibility option, not that I used it. According to TechFo, 3 has the most interesting and robust combo system. Not that I'm a master of that stuff. I mostly abused basic saber combos. Forgive me, ye gods of tech. Zero himself is customizable with chips that replace the palette swap system of two and allow for three equipable benefits compounding with the cyber elves. Basically, they acknowledge that one and two were super hard and eased three up with ways to increase total avatar strength. And that's to say nothing of the unlockable modes, but yeah. 3 is pretty juicy. Add to that the interactive stage elements for that bonus flare, unforgettable bosses, the return of a proper series villain. Zero Three is easily the most exciting game so far. Dr. Vile returns, controlling an immensely powerful Reploid, Omega, the Dark Elf for some reason, Copy X, and a number of loyal underlings. He seizes control of Neo Arcadia, creating immediate tension between humans and the Resistance, and even strife within Neo Arcadia between himself and the Four Guardians, or or remaining three anyway. It's an intense game with an even greater emphasis than past games on Zero's identity, being a hero, fighting for who he believes in, living up to the legend. I think it probably hits teens harder than older people, right? A story about being true to your best qualities, regardless of the circumstances. Life's hard, but Zero puts up his sword and deals with it. You can see where the emotional roots take place, where the series truly comes into its own in those moments. I like and understand Zero. He's just like me, for real, for real. Who knew they'd tack something that smart onto a spin-off hardcore running gun? Things have transpired. Oh, fuck. <laughs> I can spill it on my floor myself. I can clean up. I'm an adult. I love Zero Four. Oh! When I started this series, all I knew was four. It's the game I had as a teen. I played through all the levels on easy mode countless times and eventually on normal. So I actually had half an idea of what was coming. Even if this video is happening, 15 years later? If only teen me could see me now. The game starts with the good guys staving off a reploid attack on a fleeing convoy. Turns out Neo Arcadia went mildly authoritarian after the psychopath with immense power rolled up and cooed the place. Humans flee the city, but are often harassed or outright killed by Vile's goons. It's a good setup, with tension immediately established between reploids and humans, having to help them to change their minds. Having Zero outwardly refuse to plead and discuss, he simply does. Demonstrates heroism. Love it. I love this scene where Zero thinks he's alone with the guy, but... Oh no! Oh my god! Zero Four is the easiest of the bunch, including the ZX subseries, at least if you engage with it on that level. It's got tough stages, really frustrating stuff like any of these games, but only if you choose to play when the sky darkens and the wind whistles the mournful sighs of ill omen. Okay, I'll shut the f*** up. It's the weather system. You can choose good or bad weather when you start to effectively swap between easy and normal mode. Normal mode's rough like any other game, minus a few stages, but easy makes things straight up casual, or for first timers, fun. It's a beautiful system and encourages experimentation with either to see how the beautifully executed sprite work changes between versions. Like, the game may not look all that impressive, but for the GBA, the level of visual mastery the games convey with their environments, their settings, it's always been a strong series and really doubles down here. Once again, the elves have been scrapped and reanimated into something fresh, a consistent elf buddy you sink crystals into to power up, generally used for health buffs, but if you're feeling spicy, you can take one of the other 
other paths. I really like this method for consolidating crystal drops for one purpose. Through three games, I've been doing all kinds of dumb shit yeah. with the crystals, handing them to Tubby so he'll haul his fat ass somewhere else, jamming them down the throats of elves to power up, draining everything I have for a minor health upgrade. It's been rough. But 4 made it consistent, made sure you didn't have to scour the levels for health. We respect that around here. Yes, you give up the rod weapons, even the shield, and that's crummy for longtime fans. Tech masters, combo fiends, but to be fair, you get a crappy hand grab that can become a stolen weapon. I bet the devs saw that 90% so most players and not hardcore fans didn't really bother with the additional stuff and scrapped it for a quirky gimmick and the occasional environmental application. Not graceful, certainly an unnecessary downgrade, but one I'm hardly qualified to question after all. There's also this bizarre scrap part system where you combine different drop parts into upgrades like the three slot customization before, only I never really found any good recipes until I went online. And we're talking like gating a double jump upgrade and and more behind an arcane wall of confusion, or the internet. So, bonus points for coming out by the time most homes had internet, I guess. It's not much different than 3 in that regard. Yeah, it's not incredible. The potential for a major gameplay system to just be dead is higher than it should be. Lastly, the EX skills, a trend of rewards started in 2 and more adequately realized here, demanded consistent high scores across levels to unlock every special trick. EX skills partly exist to shore up the chip issue introduced in the first game, where simply knowing what chip to select at any given time helps you destroy bosses much faster than probably intended and they broadly shuffled that on to EX skills going forward. In 3, I thought that the game was getting easier on me because I unlocked 2 right away, but they stopped trickling in and I realized I just wasn't up to snuff. Sad day for K-Bash. But in 4, all you need to do is complete the normal mode stage and beat the boss to get their associated EX skill. So if you accept the challenge, you're guaranteed the reward. I really love that. No score counting or restarting. I did the thing. I got the bread. I understand it's more casual, but Jesus, dude, I'm not about to spend my adult life mastering one single entry of the Game Boy Advance's library. No offense to speedrunners. God bless. Most of the bosses are much easier, too. At least, I think they are. And while I have more experience with them than the previous sets, it feels a lot easier to brute force victory with well-timed dodges and aggressive sword combos. I mean, I barely used the EX skills on these bosses because it just wasn't that necessary. I don't want to go into the combo system because it's more for people actually trying to dig in, and it's totally unnecessary to just enjoying the games as presented. And even with that caveat, I still think 4 is the easiest to jump into, the easiest to have fun in, and the most endearing overall, despite 3's triumphs. And I know that's not a popular take. For reference, 4 did away with just about all the narrative dressing. The four guardians don't appear as interactable characters or bosses the way they did in 1 to 3. Copy X and El Piso have nothing to do with the game directly. Dr. Vile is present, having just started his reign of terror, every character introduced here specifically does not return, and while gameplay systems vary, the actual mechanics don't much, at least not to average players. You could play this game alone and miss almost nothing, or feel like you missed nothing, unless you're really big on seeing story happen. So you can, and should, jump right into 4 if you're looking to have fun and make it make sense. If the levels are too hard, pick the easy versions, it's great. Zero Four 4 is the end of the series proper, the end of the physical record of these characters' lives, so it ends how you'd expect. You work the whole game to finally bridge the gap between the Resistance and the Neo-Arcadians, now that the ruler of Neo-Arcadia is fully mask off, as it were. You're met with distrust, but show your dedication to peace repeatedly. Save civilians, rescue hostages, eventually convert a Reploid in service to Vile, just taking orders so the humans can stay oppressed, but alive. And eventually you confront the great tyrant of Neo-Arcadia himself. I used to think this scene was incredibly badass, never mind that his first form has him summoning past bosses to dunk your ass, but the dialogue had me at whatever age. I never cared about justice, and I don't recall ever calling myself a hero. I have always only fought for the people I believe in. I won't hesitate. If an enemy appears in front of me, I will destroy it! Chills. Well, mostly. Nowadays, it's really apparent that anytime Vile is talking, literally anytime, he's saying the most childishly manipulative crap possible. So he's immediately wrong and stupid the minute he opens his mouth. Like, he genuinely conflates Reploids starting a war to free themselves from second-class citizenship and evil. 
Shut the f up, Vile. But it sells itself in the moment. A satellite plummeting to Earth. The legendary Zero versus the mad Dr. Vile. One determined to save the Earth, and the other determined to destroy it. And it all inevitably burns up in the atmosphere. I'm more emotional over games these days, I find, but nothing really hit that way in the previous titles, even when they tried. Copy X, Alpizo, Omega, and Zero's original body, they were certain to die. But Zero was everything, the hope of humanity, and he dies that way, fading into falling stars. Zex. Mega Man ZX. Zex. I'm serious, it's right there. With no sign of the mild gravy train stopping and a dead protagonist, Inti Create started production on an expanded gameplay concept of the Zero series. And while it's similar in terms of controls, difficulty, and appearance to the originals, it opened the world up, effectively transforming the core experience into a Metroidvania. Not exactly, but just about. You still need to traverse a world, power up, and unlock new areas, though it's more accurately handled like a hyper-expanded version of Zero One's hub concept. It's still about killing bosses, you only power up meaningfully and unlock new zones via boss kills, the game's divided into missions. That mostly means they tacked on three to four hours with overworld travel. I've forgotten the protagonist's name. Let me stop scripting here to look that up real quick. Vent. Vent out my ass! Vent and his friend are working their Amazon delivery job and take a minute to criticize the extremely funny Slither Corporation. Slither. We're like a minute in, and every name is funny. What do you mean her name is Prairie? Some events occur, and we end up fusing with the cargo, basically the preserved soul of X himself in biometal form. So this is Sailor Moon for boys? Is it not? Some more events occur, and we get Zero Form as well. The villain in this game, aside from some idiot underlings, is Serpent, the head of Slither Incorporated. This is parody. I imagine fans of the Zero series would find this entry enjoyable, especially in a casual sense. It's less set up for speedruns and fast gameplay. Like you'd expect, you've got to wander all over the place looking for what's next. Even with guidance, it's a pain because it's not laid out sequentially, like you'll have to go back to an old area to find a new one in a once inaccessible place, and that's fine, but it amounts to heaps of wasted time. There are no cyber elves, no real customization options, no real alternate weapons, no progression, except of course, for the new model change. Killing certain bosses unlocks new forms stolen from those enemies. They've all got some usefulness, especially if you're willing to make any attempt to figure them out. There's a meme that Harpuya, the green form, is top tier, and there's mild resistance to that because all forms are useful, and really, you don't need to know this because it doesn't matter, but the truth's a compromise. It is top tier for granting a level of mobility and air control otherwise unseen in other models. It's got more utility by design. Like, you don't use the water one much outside the water. The ninja's only super useful attacks on a limited resource. I love looking into how people perceive power and usefulness in games for the most utterly minute concepts. Why do we obsess over minutia? Who are we connecting with? Does anyone actually care about which game from this or that series is best? Is it worth sideswiping someone online over? Damn, game got me dooming. Frankly, with this game's sequel in place, I don't see a lot of worth mentioning anything beyond basics, except one thing. With the timeline shifted 200 years in the future, a whole host of new characters fighting some very old struggles, the souls of past warriors being drawn on for power in the form of biometal, the arguable downgrade in boss design, everything Zex does in its attempt to establish a new conflict merely retreads old ground. It feels exactly exactly like Elrond in the Lord of the Rings books. As a full series player, I remember back even to the Elder Days. I have seen four ages of the Zero World and many defeats and many fruitless victories. Sorry, I got caught up half-quoting. Everything present in-game is the pale echo of a more vital struggle. Serpent is a less consequential vile, Vent a less impactful zero. The various bosses, mirages, and imitators. I imagine, even if it were the better game, that fewer players would master it. Zex doesn't command the same importance the others did. Advent. Okay. Who? Can't be all that bad. You can pick a boy or girl, Gray and Ash. That's like... Same thing, but okay. High saber damage, girl. I'm all for that. Calm down. I'll go check on the mission now. Uh, doesn't that sound a little strange? I'm going to go ahead and meet our booty face to face. Was this dubbed in Singapore? What the f Woo! is this? Dubbed in Japan? 
What? Advent is the first Zero game to feature a fully English dub, or general cutscene voice acting beyond boss quotes like the other games. It's not fairly terrible, it's consistently terrible, but mostly because if you want something convincingly localized, you're gonna need native speakers. This protagonist sounds awful. If you want it, you'll have to yank it from my cold hunter hands. Oh, and she's obsessed with Ash. Booty, 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 booty! I can't. Anyway, Ash is some kind of aerial brigand and- I am the author of my story from here on out. Yeah, okay, Titus, pipe down. She's almost slain by this awful creature from Zex, a man so embarrassingly short he needed a hat to compensate. So, Ben Shapiro. Now the quest to tell her story begins, and you traipse around the world like the pseudotroidvania presented prior, killing a host of animalian reploids, powering up and inserting yourself into a story you don't belong to. To be fair to Zex and the subseries at large, much of the level design, when you're not in the open world, is really tight and engaging, forces you to pay attention or die. It's the same foundation as the Zero series proper, just engaged with in different ways and built to be walked back through. The one gameplay shakeup this time is letting the player turn into defeated bosses. Holy, how long did it take? It's so obvious those designs were amazing, and you're just figuring this out now? Zex's form changes were pretty light, didn't get experimental enough, or were limited enough that it genuinely felt good staying in zero form for most of the game. Advent includes so many forms that you're bound to experiment, maybe actually find something worth using in certain situations, and even though the number vastly proliferated, seriously, there's like 10 of these? Most are bad. Some are outright unusable, which is just sad. That's a giant icy crocodile mech and you don't get that. It sucks, but the bulk of them can help out in interesting ways throughout levels, buff your pre-existing abilities, or let you ignore level design, like if this were Kirby. Really big ups for that, not gonna lie. Platforming this type for six games is not particularly fun. Your brain will combust. That excitement diminishes in boss fights, where it becomes really obvious what's good and what isn't. How low a certain form's damage is, but you might come across a more comfortable strategy by screwing around with different forms than doing what the guide online says in personal experience. How do you tell the same story six times? It's wild that the Zex subseries cut down on customization, probably. I guess they made up for it with form changes, but it's not like you can sit in the hedgehog form or whatever forever. Most of these things can't use ladders, have limited platforming ability, and that's half the game. So it really doesn't feel like you're building your avatar like three or four insured, but picking out new costumes to try out when appropriate. It's an underwhelming paradigm shift. I said you don't belong in this story. I mean that all kinds of new reploid upstarts are accessing biometal like Zex, pale echoes of a more vital conflict, and you rudely interject yourself and put them all down while everyone shrieks incoherently about being the strongest mega Mega Man. I didn't even know there were Mega Man. I guess the four guardians? It just sounds so embarrassing to say out loud. And Ash's identity is a mystery here, but she was effectively put on a destined path via Master Albert, one of the three wise guys, who shares DNA with her, and wiped her memory and somehow caused her memories to unlock while acquiring each biometal. It's not terribly compelling. No matter what happens in the story, Ash is still dumb. The other Mega Man are still cringy and quirky as it gets. Albert's just a lame or Dr. Vile. And when you stuff his dipshit uh. plan for world domination, he gets all pissy like, Goodbye, Ash. You can have your peace. And rot in it! <laughs> This is the part of the video where there'd be a conclusion about the whole series, but really I'm probably gonna end up making some kind of essentialist argument about the old days being better than the new, and someone will hit me with the, but I grew up with ZX. You can't say that. Okay, sure. Sure. Hey, this collection's on Steam right now, and Switch. You know what to do if it looked like it for you. Hey, it's K-Bash. Huge thanks goes out to my $4 patrons whose names are on the screen. The show's finally getting somewhere thanks to the community's generosity. And special thanks goes to my extra generous patrons who are... Adam Welch, Acropolon, Alex, Andy Blarg, Arch, Axon A, Basement Dweller, BZ Soul, Ben M, Boha, Boom Dead, Brios, Cal, Can I Cuss on Captain Here, Blasted, Captain Blasted, Captain Wave, Caesar T, Cordon, Christo, Toby Gold, Couch Mobile, Corgi the Lad, Crater, CW Glass, Labrie, Cynical, Daddy Dagoth, Don Dean, Dakota Storm Jones, Jones Stag, Swaggy, David Castillo, Dara, Dakota, Dr. Cullen, PhD, Dylan Coffee, 8 Bit 
Funk, Elias, Elpio, Elsa, Aesthetico, Exa, Fupa Saiyan, Frankenstein, Frisky Nippler, Glyphseeker, Guard Corey, Gucci Plant, Hatsune Miku's Crack House, Arkash, Demon, Game and Station, Hexmax, Horn Tiger, Huey, Ingenious Cloud, Punched a Sandwich, Irradiated Cherry, Dice Kyle, It's Time to Sue, It's Not Good, Ivy, Ruth Langley, Jacob, James, Jason Lasky, Jaden, Jadeus, Joke Frog, Jordan Joyner, Keegan Too Cool, Clock Crated, Crazy Dark Chocolate, Ice, Latrix, Laundry Mom, Lego Sid, Juan, Low Fat Mogul, Lucas Boyd, Lucky McSmucky, Magical Madman, Mama Rollins, Markulis, Maximilian Wolfgang Niver, Mike DeVere, Milky Moo Official, Monochrome Only, Mr. Dodongo, Night Renewed, Nido Torpedo, Norian, Daridius, Old Burgle, Old Man Cranberry, Only LK, The Plant, Pandemic Cowboy, Pinata, PK Gaming, Potato Gaming HD, Quasar McDougal, Quillwork, Quinn, Reasonable Willow, Reggie Rodriguez, Sagit Trash, Siren Smells Good, Salty Smash, Sam Vertigo, Scribe Slendy, Sakai No Warda, Shot, Silver Bear 909, Soon. God! Sleepy Wabbit, Suckdolager, Space Lizard, Spooky Grimalkin, Squishward, Starbound, Storm Strider, Sublime Cataclysm, Super Sandwich Guy, Sword Chubbington, The Big Bubby, The Salt Knight, Big Dick Mystic, Drips Heartthrob, Timid the Writer, Travis Edwards, Twiddle Chungus, Vid, Venom, Vice Pup, Viewers Like You, Vic, Waposa, Weed Trash, Well Shit, Wayland, Where Am I Hell, Winter Solstice, Zanny Tanner, Yeet Kundo, You Poison or You Pose, Zachary Livesey, Zachary Z, Zanasa, Z Zane the Impure, Zane the Pure, Zeradax, Zed Slayer Gamer, Zero Zalazar, Silvlin Ray, Cyberpunk. If you'd like to help support the show, unlock new long-form projects, and help me keep improving, check out my Patreon. We got all kinds of goals and lots more videos in store. Stay tuned for more. K-Bash out.